We are so delighted to welcome Daniel Markey of Johns Hopkins to be with us today to talk about his new book, uh, China's Western Horizon. Um, I have to say, one of the things I was most excited about this book is that it provides both literally and politically a different vantage point, um, a, a different way of thinking, a different lens of thinking about China and its relations with the rest of the world, including the U.S. It also provides just very literally a different lens, a different part of the world to think about. And for all of us um, sitting wherever we're sitting on our laptops who are maybe getting a little bored of the views out of our window, um, Dan's, Dan's writing and Dan's lens provides um, some really welcome um, changes of scenery. So I'm going to invite my colleagues to put up the map. And while I introduce Dan, I'm going to um, invite you to, to take a moment to, to really think about what it means if you see the world uh, looking west from China and what that looks like. Uh, Dan is a research professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Before that, he was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he produced um, a book on Pakistan with uh, the wonderful title that I think we'll, we'll perhaps get into later called No Exit from Pakistan. Um, before that, he served on the State Department's policy planning staff under Secretaries of State Powell and Rice, um, home of many uh, deep and profound thinkers on these issues. And before that, he was a professor at, at Princeton University. So um, Dan has had many years and much experience, including uh, deep travel and reporting experience for this book back when we all took that for granted. Um, of thinking not so much directly about China, but about the countries on, on China's periphery, which uses a different lens for this. Um, and so, Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna start you off by inviting you to be maybe a bit more travelogy than than we usually are in in this kind of a setting, um, because usually when we talk about China and China's um, aspirations on the world stage and its attempts to build global power, that can can sound quite abstract. In an, in an American context or sitting here in Washington, D.C., but your book offers vivid and specific examples of how China's actions are changing, changing communities and changing geopolitics at the regional and national level. And some of them might be surprising to those of us who are used to a, an America-centric or even East Asia-centric view. So I'm going to pick a few of my favorites and, and ask you to, to, to start by sort of telling stories about them. And the first one, because it's so deep in your own your own research and your own professional life, is the uh, the Pakistani port at Gwadar, which I'm not even did I did I get that right? Pretty close, yeah. Gwadar, like water. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll start there. Um, first of all, let me just uh, thank you, uh, Heather, for moderating this, but also to New America and to Solid State for making this possible. Just as an aside, uh, now has not been the easiest time to launch a new book uh, in a pandemic, and so it's really great to, to be able to, to see you and also to be able to explain the book to, to your audience. So, so thanks for that. Um, so, Water, uh, yes, the book opens with this story of uh, Pakistan's deep sea port um, along the Arabian Sea. And it's a relatively new port, but it has a long history. And this is a part of Pakistan that um, not too many people, uh, outsiders, tend to go to. In fact, a lot of Pakistanis don't go there because it's not all that safe. Uh, it's been an area of um, active insurgency and secessionist movements uh, for decades now. Um, but the, the story of the book opens there because in uh, January of 2000, the then president of, of Pakistan, Pervez Musharraf, who was also had been the army chief and military dictator, um, traveled to China. And out of the blue, at least according to Chinese sources that I've talked to, asked if they would build him a port at Gwadar. And their immediate reaction was one of surprise. And uh, they even sent some junior diplomats to kind of scurry back and say, you know, was he serious about this? Why would he want this port? And the reason they were so surprised is because this location wasn't really connected to anything. It didn't have a commercial rationale. It seemed like in the middle of nowhere. And worse than that, actually a kind of a dangerous part of the world. Um, but he said, no, he wanted it. And uh, the reason I tell this story, and he had his reasons, and I can get into those, but he had his reasons. And the reason I tell this story though is, um, Subsequently, over the past couple of decades, Gwadar has come to be one 
of the so-called a part of the string of pearls or locations that uh, outside analysts, some Western analysts, some Indian analysts have seen as evidence of China's deep uh, strategic plan for the region, where it intends to project its power into other places on the map. And what I learned in this story was that this was a Pakistani idea. This was a port that the Pakistanis came to China and China reluctantly took this project on board with some reservations. And the reason why I thought that was so relevant is because again and again, as we look to China's West in places like Pakistan and well beyond and some of the other countries that I focus on, we see evidence that the opportunities available for China's expansion are opportunities that are created, defined, in some cases limited by uh, the countries themselves. And this is a really important message, I think, especially for us sitting in Washington and especially now as we seem to be uh, engaging ever more in a, in a new kind of Cold War with China, it isn't enough for us to, as we think about that, to, to contemplate what does China want or what is China up to? We have to do that, but we also have to ask ourselves, what do these other countries want? What are they up to? Because that really shapes outcomes in fundamental ways. The Port of Gwadar wouldn't have been a Chinese project if it wasn't first a Pakistani project. And I'll conclude with the observation that a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, I had an opportunity to then interview President Musharraf uh, and ask him about this very thing and to confirm that what the Chinese diplomats who I had spoken to before had said was correct. And in fact, it was. He was very proud of the idea that Gwadar was his idea, that he had approached the Chinese uh, to help develop it, and that he had his own goals, uh, strategic goals to push the Indians off, to make it clear that the Chinese were backing Pakistan and so on, and that he was pursuing those goals uh, by this approach. And so now we see this as a potential bastion or, or outpost of Chinese power on the Arabian Sea in the future, uh, but we have to remember how it got there and what the origins are. And perhaps that'll also give us some ideas as to what the limits on the use of Gwadar and other places will be to China as we go forward. Great. So I should have said, Daniel and I are going to talk for about half an hour, and then we will be taking your questions, which you can contribute through the Q&A button um, at the bottom of the page as we, as we go through a, a whole range of, of these topics. But so um, two, two further questions about Gwadar. First, you were not able to go there. Is that right? And you or I or most of us would not be able to go there either, which which is quite different from how we usually think of commercial port facilities, even those being developed by one country in another country. Yeah, so um, I have been to Balochistan, uh, I've been to Pakistan many times, uh, but access to water has been over the past few years, and as I was conducting the research for this book, uh, relatively limited to internationals. Um, there have been a number of journalists who have gotten access on occasion, but even that has been somewhat constrained. Their movements have been limited. Uh, there are security concerns uh, that, that clearly would drive part of that. And I think part of it is that the stories that come out from the port haven't always played to the advantage of the Pakistani government or of the Chinese government in ways that make them uncomfortable. So uh, some of the reports suggest, for instance, the severe limits that the port construction has imposed on local populations, the frustrations of um, the Baloch people who live nearby, including fishermen uh, and their villages uh, that no longer have access to traditional uh, areas where they, they would go fishing, uh, and the limitations on access to, to good drinking water and so on, and the political frustration that that engenders. That tends to be the focus of a lot of the stories that they get when they allow outsiders, Westerners mainly, to go there and report. And so they've been inclined, I think, not to let too many Westerners go back. Uh, and that's, that's the way it's been over the past few years. Which brings up another point that you make repeatedly in the book, that although it might look to us now that the location was chosen by China for its, its maritime security and naval purposes, that in fact, Musharraf had much more domestic political purposes in mind. I mean, why would you try to stick a major port facility in the midst of a, of a, a restive and generally unfriendly province? Well, it's still not clear that that is a good idea or that ever was a good idea. But um, Musharraf did have a kind of a twofold uh, 
uh, game plan, or at least he claims that, uh, on the one hand, really was actually a more of a, a broader regional strategic initiative. That is, if you could open a Chinese back port, uh, another one on the Arabian Sea, that would be another port for uh, Pakistan as well, in the event of a naval conflict with India, uh, shutting down Karachi wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, Pakistan would have multiple options. Pakistan could also use the Port of Water, uh, which, as you probably saw from the map, is closer to the Persian Gulf, would be able to uh, threaten Indian shipping uh, going in and out of the Gulf. So, um, so these were kind of broader strategic aims that a military man like Musharraf would think about. But they also came at least cloaked in a sense of the potential for domestic economic development, uh, that this would be a place that an engine of growth for the regional economy, uh, this would provide opportunities for locals and for other Pakistanis. Uh, and the interesting story there, and the story that I go on to tell at, at greater length in a, in a chapter on Pakistan, uh, is that you know, all of these outside investment efforts by China, or in fact by other countries, tend to come with mixed outcomes. And often there are winners uh, in Pakistan, people who stand to gain from these, but there are also losers. And in an already fairly conflicted country uh, with deep political cleavages, ethnic cleavages, socioeconomic cleavages like Pakistan, uh, creating additional areas of competition domestically has as much chance of creating greater un instability as it does of improving economic outcomes and creating greater stability, which is claimed to be the goal of both Musharraf and now increasingly of China itself. Um, because of course, as the story, if we update this story, it didn't end there with Gwadar. We have now got the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, tens of billions of dollars promised, at least about 20 billion actually delivered of Chinese outside investment in Pakistan. So we're seeing um, greater Chinese involvement in all of these areas but not necessarily uh, a stabilizing outcome uh, coming of all of this. You make that point both with respect to the situation within Pakistan and the other countries you highlight, but you also make it with respect to regional power relations. And you say that there was maybe this hope that China could or China would find itself forced to take on the role of regional peacemaker. And that somehow in this part of the world that China would help help diffuse conflict between India and Pakistan. And both here and in the other uh, regions you look at, you you come away instead with the with the conclusion that you think in the long run that Chinese activities are actually going to um, make regional instability worse rather than better. Say a little bit about that with respect to the India-Pakistan conflict, and then I'm going to pivot you to Kazakhstan. Sure. Um, yeah, it's not a, and sadly, it's not a good news story that I tell. Uh, you know, there are, there are many analysts, I've heard a number of them in Washington, uh, who will say, you know, look, um, this is a messy part of the world. And the United States has, has uh, rarely had success in all of its efforts bringing about greater stability between, say, countries like India and Pakistan, bringing peace between them. It seems like a fool's errand. But if China wants to get more invested in this part of the world, let them. Um, and let them suffer with and potentially solve the problems that we've had so much trouble grappling with. And um, unfortunately, the, the conclusion that I have reached, at least tentatively so far, is that China has no intention of shouldering those responsibilities or burdens, that you can have simultaneously an extension of Chinese influence, an economic uh, influence, a political influence, even extension of Chinese ability to project its military power over land into parts of Pakistan or beyond into Central Asia, you can have all of that without having a stabilizing presence. That is, China is not terribly interested in investing in these societies in ways that at least I think would be more likely to bring about that kind of peace or stability over, over time. Now, in the specific India-Pakistan example, uh, we'd like to hope that, uh, say, strengthening Pakistan and making Pakistan a more wealthy country with Chinese investment and further Chinese investment into India might make both sides, India and Pakistan, more inclined to get along, to see all of the benefits of peace. Uh, that would be a hope. And it's conceivable. 
Um, but what we've seen in practice is that China's backing of Pakistan may be as or more likely, I think, to embolden Pakistan, to make Pakistan feel like it has a, a patron and, and to uh, believe that it can in fact continue to push its revisionist agenda with India, that is a change in boundaries and things like changes in uh, the status of Kashmir and so on, in ways that if Pakistan felt weaker, it would have to step back from. Similarly, India, and I do get into India's perspective in all of this, because we have to look at the Indian point of view, India sees China's involvement in Pakistan as not stabilizing, but increasingly threatening. Now, threatening both because it does encourage Pakistan's, from Indians' perspective, bad behavior, and also because it suggests that China uh, will be a major player in India's neighborhood, uh, which is something that uh, New Delhi has been deeply concerned about, would like to see less of, not more of. And so it's inclining India to be more wary and to arm itself and prepare itself and possibly uh, to contemplate and even participate in more kind of violent exchanges with Pakistan just to convince China uh, that this is not a good idea, that its involvement there is not a good idea. So this doesn't add up, uh, as I say, in a stabilizing way, it actually adds up in a worrisome way. So this makes me want to jump ahead a bit to the, the U.S. strategy part of the conversation because there has been considerable thought in Washington circles in recent years that Washington should should move more and more, um, and this is a, a bipartisan idea, to see India as a key ally in, in, in that both countries are democracies, albeit both countries are somewhat challenged democracies at the moment, but that the countries are somehow natural allies to help um, blunt or contain um, Beijing in a commercial sense, um, in a sort of spreading of, of autocratic technology sense, but also in a straight up military sense, you, you seem to make the argument that in fact, that's going to be more complicating and tension accelerating than it is straightforwardly beneficial, but I'd, I'd love to hear you make your case. Sure, yeah. Um, look, I think uh, you're right. Uh, one of the consistent features, not just of, certainly not just of the Trump administration, but of the Obama administration before it and the Bush administration before that, and even going back to Clinton, was a recognition yep. of the potential of India's strategic promise as a, as a counterbalance or a counterweight, big democratic, huge populous uh, country and society in, in the heart of Asia or in part of Asia uh, that would balance China. Um, and I generally support that. I mean, I think that India has huge potential and that, that we have every reason to want to explore that. The caveat there, uh, the, the question mark, is, has to do with the specific ways in which we engage with India. And if by our engagement with India and China's engagement with Pakistan, we end up in a kind of a two block South Asia scenario where India and Pakistan are arming themselves to the teeth uh, to engage in an arms race with one another and that we're egging them on and that US resources, rather than uh, broadening the base of Indian power and creating, a, a, as I say, a, a counterweight to China, both politically and economically, as well as security wise, if we're principally invested in the security side and India is principally seeing those investments tools, weapons, military platforms, and defense platforms, and so on, as a means to deal with Pakistan, then what we're doing is we're just feeding into a kind of, a, I think, a wasteful, dangerous, potentially very dangerous uh, arms race dynamic in a region where we've seen this game before. Uh, this was, in a sense, in reverse the game that we played during the Cold War, with us more or less on Pakistan's side and the Soviet Union frequently more or less on India's side. And what we learned from that, or what we think we learned from that, is it didn't work to anyone's particular advantage. Uh, it didn't work to the superpowers' advantage, a lot of wasted resources. And in the region, it fueled a conflict that might not have gone away, but might also not have been quite so violent um, and, and bloody uh, as it was had it not been for superpower support. So that's the kind of thing that I worry about. Well, speaking of um, aftermath of the Cold War, that seems like a good moment to shift us up to, to Central Asia. And I'm going to um, invite my New America colleagues to pop the Mac back up for one second. 
Um, because one of the really fun nuggets of history um, about this, about your book, was uh, the idea that um, for a significant portion of um, history, there were major civilizations that located the center of the world in Central Asia. Um, and much as for, for much of Anglo-American history, we maybe thought of the center of the world as being London or Greenwich or in the Cold War, Washington. Um, but there is um, this history and these um, residual cultural, diplomatic, economic links that go, that go back to this time, which was fascinating and fun to, to read about. And so maybe point to why it shouldn't be um, as surprising as it, as it may be to many Americans to, to see um, the enormously large and wealthy country of Kazakhstan as, um, as, a, as balancing um, in some very astute and interesting ways between Russia and China. And, and really, you, you depict um, an autocratic ruler that at least as long as he's able to, the last of the post-Soviet rulers in the region, who at least as long as he's able to stay in power, seems to be able to, to pick and choose. And um, the, 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 the aphorism that you quote is that uh, Russia is the gun and China is the purse. Um, which is, you know, you, you could be in, you could find yourself in worse situations than a number of Kazakhstan's neighbors have. So um, the, you, uh, you describe very vividly in the book the, what um, the Kazakh-China border economic zone looks like. And, and maybe you could start from that as a, as a way of, of talking about what the Kazakh case looks like. And, and we can put away the map now. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And thanks. Uh, there, there's a lot to a lot to play with there. And um, you know, the for me, the history also learning better uh, the history of um, of continental Eurasia uh, and the interconnections between parts of the world that uh, that I at least and I think many Americans tend to see as fundamentally distinct. Um, uh, for instance, South Asia is not the same thing as Central Asia, and Central Asia is, in our mind, I think, often considered very far from East Asia or China, but yet uh, these places do have a, a kind of a, a gray uh, quality where one intertwines with the next, and historically they've been bound together uh, at times, uh, now we're talking about uh, during the Silk Road period, so it's it's been hundreds of years, uh, but at times they were culturally intertwined uh, through uh, the communication of major religions, uh, Buddhism, Islam, and so on, and um, economically intertwined with critical resources, including war horses, uh, being routinely imported from China, uh, sorry, from Central Asia to China, right? China was, was uh, really relied on these types of things, not to mention the actual silk of the Silk uh, Road or the Silk Route. Um, so this is an area of um, cultural interconnection. Uh, and uh, th in particular, we see this now in the context of um, the nature of the, the identity, the ethnic and religious identity of Uyghurs uh, inside of China. But you asked about the specific question of the, the border area between Kazakhstan and China, where I had an opportunity to visit. And I've read a number of, of travelogues of this. I'm not the first or and certainly won't be the last uh, you know, Washington-based uh, person to go up to Horgos uh, and to actually see the trade and economic zone that's being built and the dry port um, that's being built right on the Kazakhstan-China border. But it was still fascinating and um, a little bit sleepy uh, at the time when I went to visit. Um, it happened to be a holiday, but um, what you could see was the, the early stages of, in terms of the dry port, of, a, of an opportunity for uh, Chinese goods to be um, kind of reloaded onto trains and then transshipped uh, across the continent uh, and into and onto uh, Western Europe as an alternative to maritime shipping. And in the economic zone, what you could see was the birth, potentially, of uh, what looked like a binational new city, uh, Kazakhstan, China city, of potentially in the future hundreds of thousands to millions of people um, where you could have a uh, commercial interchange between the two. All of this uh, would have seemed 
completely unfathomable uh, because we're talking about a part of the world that is kind of in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it feels that way. You've got enormous uh, step, sweeps of step going on as far as the eye can see and not much other than horses and mountains in the background. Um, and, uh, and for hundreds of years, there hasn't been a lot going on there. And now you see the physical manifestation of China's uh, economic power, uh, and potential for regional economic integration in a very new way. And this is not the old Silk Road. It is something fundamentally new and different. And we have to kind of map, uh, wrap our minds around how that will change the map in ways that you were, you were describing earlier. And let me wrap up here with the observation or tie this to the political consequences of all of this. Uh, Kazakhstan is an unusual country an autocratic uh, regime, basically still run, although titular responsibility has been handed off now, but basically still run by the same man, Nazarbayev, who's been in power since the end of the Soviet Union, um, and came out of that system. So he's deeply familiar with that. And is, I think, perhaps uniquely qualified to balance the competing agendas of Moscow and Beijing uh, as they go forward, and of course, the interests of Kazakhstan itself and to try to uh, weave his way between two major powers, one on either, on either two giants on either side. Kazakhstan itself uh, is relatively weak, although wealthy from, from energy or relatively wealthy, uh, doesn't have the wherewithal to withstand either side. And so has to play them against one another. And one of the core questions I ask in the book is what happens after Nazarbayev? How does that balance potentially shift, possibly dramatically, and potentially in ways that would really favor Chinese influence over what has traditionally, at least now for hundreds of years, been a sphere of Russian influence and of direct Russian control, uh, of course, during the Soviet period. Um, and what would that mean? What would that mean for the balance in the relationship between China and Russia? Would Russia be willing to accept that? I have deep concerns uh, about how the tensions or the, the underlying potential tensions between Russia and China could be exacerbated by that extension of Chinese influence in through Central Asia. This doesn't happen overnight, and it hasn't happened overnight. Uh, this is something gradual, but it could happen stepwise with China um, sort of dramatically enhancing its, uh, its role in the region at various points. And I think we saw one of those at the last financial crisis. And I think we could be poised to see another one of those now uh, with the aftermath of the, of the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, and the economic consequences of that, which China seems to be likely to weather uh, better than Russia and may put China again into, the, into a pole position uh, to extend its influence, uh, first through economic means and then potentially through political and even security means after that. Before, um, before we get to the, the COVID part of the conversation, um, I do want to ask you about the Uyghurs, because um, as you write, um, the, Uyghur, the borders in this region, like many regions, are somewhat artificial, um, and Uyghur presence and influence in Kazakhstan is maybe stronger than many Westerners understand. On the other hand, as China's mistreatment of the Uyghurs becomes better and better known, that doesn't seem to be having any impact on its engagement either in Central Asian societies or in Muslim societies, which make up the majority of the ones you talk about in the book. So what does, what, what in Kazakhstan in particular and more broadly are, is China's treatment of the Uyghurs going to matter? Well, I think that it will matter, but it's not a, a direct uh, consequence. In other words, um, I, you know, I think it's a little bit more complicated than simply uh, Muslims around the world will be upset about the way that China has treated Muslims in China, including Uyghurs. I mean, worst of all Uyghurs, but also other Muslims in China, uh, and will respond violently and negatively uh, to China across the board. That's clearly not the case. And I see that in all the, I mean, all the countries that I really focus on, whether it's Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, all of them, uh, including their clerical establishments, but also their political leaders, have more or less looked the other way uh, or have um, kind of tried to just deflect attention from China's treatment of Muslims inside of China. And the reasons are, I think, fairly obvious. Uh, they have economic interests and in some cases also political interests riding on their relationship 
with China and they can't sacrifice that uh, by criticizing China openly and so they won't do so. However, uh, Kazakhstanis, um, ethnic Kazakhs, uh, many, I think, Iranians, uh, many Pakistanis are still, I think, going to be and increasingly are aware of what China is doing. And this makes them deeply upset. In the case of Kazakhstan, this can be very personal. This can be family members who have been swept up uh, in these Chinese camps, um, either by accident or on purpose, being in the wrong place inside of China, meeting with family and so on. Um, and in other places, it's more of a, of a kind of a solidarity of, of religion, of common faith. This will make publics uh, deeply unhappy, um, will get them to see China as a problematic. And although their countries tend to have fairly good control over the flow of information, I think over time will uh, create new divides between the people, in a sense, and their leaders again, between the losers in a closer relationship with China and the winners. And those kinds of cleavages, particularly in these societies which are either authoritarian or autocratic or liberal leaning, um, these kinds of cleavages can be dangerous and they can play into broader uh, kind of potential for social discontent uh, and sort of revolutionary movements in these types of places. I don't mean to overstate it, but I, I think it's a, it's a cause of political tension and danger and it will be, uh, sort of replayed in the context of how these publics respond to their own leaders. So for instance, just one last example, in Iran, uh, some of the uh, protesters uh, over the past years have been heard to chant death to China uh, when they are protesting against their own regime. And they're doing that not because of the Uyghurs this time, but they're doing that because they think that China has supported the current regime in Tehran. And uh, they reject that and they're, they're deeply frustrated by that. So these are the kinds of tensions that could crop up uh, that China is only beginning uh, the early stages of feeling the consequence of that. But I think they'll be uh, quite meaningful over time. You also, on the, on the death to China front in Iran, you, you write about how China is able to take advantage of openings in Iran created by, by US Iran policy um, but that only works so well and that, again, to make everyday Iranians are not all that happy um, with with what they get from China as a substitute for what, what they get from the, the U.S. So how does how does the U.S.-Iran conflict look from this China looking westward lens? Well, interestingly, uh, every time that uh, Iran and its economy have been shut down by U.S. sanctions, uh, the Chinese role in Iran has grown. Um, that doesn't mean that it's grown necessarily in real dollars or, or um, real uh, economic terms, but it's grown relatively. That is, China's gotten a bigger piece of the Iranian pie because everybody else has been forced to the exits. And we saw that during the uh, earlier period, uh, during, prior to the negotiation of the JCPOA, uh, where China assumed an ever greater role in, in Iran's economy. Um, but you're right, average Iranians uh, often were deeply troubled by this because as China came in, it didn't come in with the highest quality goods uh, to sell to Iranians. It came in with junky second rate goods uh, and it engaged in barter trade that uh, typically Iranians believed um, was really benefiting Chinese sellers uh, to the detriment of their own economic interests. And quite often access to Iran's market uh, Chinese access to Iran's market put Iranian businesses out of business. So there were a lot of Iranians who have suffered from that. Now the premise, interestingly, of the JCPOA, part of it was what was so appealing from an Iranian perspective ultimately about the deal, the reason the deal was possible at all, was because it would open the door to economic in interchange with Western Europe and potentially even the United States over time and not make them so vulnerable to China. So you can tell that even just from that, from the logic of the deal, um, that uh, Iranians in general prefer not being vulnerable to, indebted to, and completely in bed with the Chinese. This is not their preference. And yet the consequences of the deal, and now the unilateral withdrawal from the deal by the United States and the slapping of sanctions back onto Iran um, have reopened the door for, for China to re uh, kind of to continue to deepen its role inside of Iran. Uh, 
and have again pushed certainly Western Europeans to the exits in ways that create those opportunities and make Iran fundamentally vulnerable uh, and dependent upon China, deeply dependent upon China. Um, now the point here is not that China is necessarily doing all of this with strategic intent to take over Iran or to uh, embed itself deeply in Iran, but it may seize that opportunity. And the opportunity will be a lot cheaper because in part because of the actions that we've taken. Of course, we didn't do those with China in mind, but as we move forward and we think about countries like Iran, our relationship with countries like Iran, we also have to be thinking about what the implications of our decisions on Iran policy will mean for our competition with China. And so we need to, to have the complexity uh, build in that additional complexity in ways that you know, decades ago we didn't have to do. Do you um, predict that um, China will increasingly supplant Russia as Iran's main, main ally, which was quite a surprise to me given the historical and geographic closeness of, of Iran and Russia? So maybe unpack that. I mean, and that's certainly very relevant to the question of, of the broader question of US-China policy. So maybe unpack that a little more. Absolutely. So, I mean, right now, Iran uh, is uh, not just economically in bed with China, but they're um, deeply dependent upon Russian uh, political patronage, but also Russian arms. And so right now, if you had to point to Iran's probably single most important outside um, partner, it would be Russia. But I do think that if we play this out over time, uh, two trends uh, tend to suggest that China will supplant Russia or two elements of this relationship. I mean, the first thing is that Russia is in many ways economically uh, and even politically, historically, is a competitor with Iran. Um, it sells the same goods, it sells hydrocarbons. And um, it has not, uh, and, and so therefore, uh, it, the economic complementarity is not there. But with China, uh, China is a buyer of hydrocarbons, Iran is a seller, and so there's greater complementarity. So I think there's a kind of a inbuilt, um, tension in the relation with Russia uh, that isn't there with China. And there's also historical tensions. Um, you know, if you look back, Iranians have no love for Russia. Uh, they have um, less of a, of a sense that um, uh, China is dangerous, I think, than that Russia is dangerous uh, strategically. There's, there's, no, there's no trust there. So I think that creates an opening. But the other big point is that Russia's on the decline. Uh, Russia's economy, certainly, but also its capacity to be a principal um, arms dealer in the world and to be uh, still a leading supplier of military technologies um, is on the decline, whereas China's is on, China is on the rise. And with every passing year, Russian technology uh, that has put it uh, at or near the front uh, in many areas uh, seeps into China, is either purchased by China and, and reverse engineered by, by Chinese companies, and then becomes available uh, from those very Chinese companies. And so if we just look into the future as others have, we see that China is poised uh, to steal Russia's mantle in all of these areas. And then you can imagine Iran turning to China rather than Russia uh, as its principal uh, supplier, outside supplier of military technology. So we have um, an audience question about how Iran's nuclear weapons program and the choices that it will have to make around its nuclear weapons program in the coming months, how that affects the Iran-China relationship. Well, um, I think that at the moment, a lot more in terms of Iran's choices on its nuclear program have mainly to do with uh, waiting out the United States uh, to our next election. Um, that is, seems to be what Tehran's principal strategic logic is. They will wait and see who wins, and then they will decide how to play the game from there. Um, China, too, has also, interestingly, played a bit more of a waiting game uh, on all of this than I would have expected, and I think a number of other analysts thought so, too. Um, you know, if, if asked um, how China would have managed the past few years, I really would have assumed that they would be somewhat more aggressive in extending their influence in Iran as the United States um, kind of basically cut off other options. Instead, China has, has been uh, more reticent. And the principal reticence comes from Beijing's recognition that actually in real terms, uh, it has much more to lose by upsetting Washington than it has to gain by uh, increasing uh, 
its, uh, its opportunities, its investments, um, and its purchasing from Iran. So it's been balancing, uh, Beijing has been balancing concerns about upsetting Washington with opportunities of Iran. And so far, in many instances, that has led it to actually scale back its involvement in Iran rather than extend it. Um, if I can imagine a situation where uh, in the future, if US-China relations deteriorate further, Beijing may make a different calculation that its relationship with the United States has deteriorated to the point that it can, um, without paying significant greater costs, it can extend its influence in Iran and it can be more supportive uh, of Iran. Um, and that would be even more likely if the United States and Iran um, also at the same time don't return to any kind of negotiated settlement. And the prospect of getting back to some version of a JCPOA, which would bring back the Europeans uh, into Iran seems to have disappeared. Then China will be the only game in town for Iran and China will see less downside risk or harm from enhancing its hand uh, with Iran. Starts to move us into the question of what U.S. strategy should be given these observations, which we we have a number of questions about. Um, and I want to start um, with an observation that you make in the book, where you say the region along China's western horizon should not be America's first priority. And I think I just heard you say, at least with respect to Iran, that this region is not China's first priority either. So does that um, does that open up chances that um, th this policy in this part of the world can unfold in ways that are different from how the U.S.-China challenge unfolds in East Asia in particular, or is everything inevitably going to be drawn into sort of one one that of U.S.-China competition, whatever that looks like? <laughs> well, I think it's really important uh, that we not. Uh, begin Cold War-like to see all of the world purely through the lens of U.S.-China competition. That has to be a part of how we see things. We have to ask that question. I think that will come increasingly naturally to U.S. policymakers to con contemplate or consider how this plays into the global competition with China. And yet, in many instances, it won't be the, the first or most important calculation. So if we go back as a good example, I think, is, is the India-Pakistan relationship. I still think that a war between India and Pakistan is much more dangerous uh, than seeing China extend its influence uh, into Pakistan. And so as we look at that part of the world, I think we still have to ask ourselves, you know, might there be opportunities to work with China uh, to avert uh, the downside risks of an India-Pakistan war or to manage that conflict if it goes back into a crisis? So we have to be kind of nimble enough to see the individual consequences of, of regional issues for what they are, and then also to flip it upside down and say, okay, but then how does that play in the short, medium, and long term into the global competition between the United States and China? We have to be able to do both of those things. Um, but to come back to your, your first question, you know, do, is this region of greatest significance to the United States? And, you know, having written this book and focused so much of my attention on this region, I'd love to be able to say, yes, this is the single most important region. But my, my conclusion is no, actually, when it comes to prioritizing parts of the world for the United States in terms of strategic investment. You know, I think, first of all, we have to obviously get our own house in order. And, and that's particularly uh, important at this moment, uh, as we're suffering as we are uh, economically and otherwise. But after that, uh, our traditional alliance partners in Western Europe and East Asia still are our priority areas. That is the core, I think, of the United States' strength geopolitically in the world. Uh, with that, uh, we continue, and the, that, those kinds of partnerships and alliances, we continue to be a real superpower. Without that, the world looks a whole lot um, uh, less unipolar or even uh, where the United States is, is a serious superpower. We lose an enormous amount from that. After those priorities come having to play through all of these other regions. And then the argument of the book is think locally, act locally, see these issues that is both our competition with China and individual concerns like Iran's nuclear program through local lenses. Think about how uh, these states themselves uh, are calculating their interests. 
and then focus American priorities uh, accordingly. Look for opportunities where, for instance, if we want to partner with Kazakhstan, um, we want to create opportunities for Kazakhstan, not only to see its only option as being China, but still keeping the door cracked open for them to work with us, say on science and technology or education or, or other areas. Uh, the same would be true in other parts uh, of the Middle East. Make ourselves a, um, a potential uh, valuable partner for a lot of these societies, even as we are not their principal partner and we are not likely uh, to be quite as important to them going forward as China's role in the region does increase. So that gets to another um, audience question. What are the risks or possible negative impacts of the U.S. trying um, to grow influence with China's Western neighbors. I guess if you could imagine a return to the, er the early post-Cold War period where there was quite a bit of Washington effort, if haphazardly, to, to grow U.S. influence in Central Asia, what would that do? What would that kind of a policy now do to U.S.-China relations? Well, frankly, I, I think it's, it's not so much a matter of the risks of doing it. It's of the implausibility of us having the resources to do it uh, in any mm -hmm. way that would be meaningful. I mean, if we think about the, the apex of American involvement, say, in Central Asia came uh, to my eye as a kind of a dual consequence of the war in Afghanistan and a sense of potential opportunity for the post-Soviet moment uh, of extending a more democratic or civilian uh, type of leadership throughout that region. Um, and we saw what happened. It, it was frustrating, extremely costly, um, and has left, I would say, uh, relatively little in the way of a sense of success uh, in, in most Americans' minds. And so the, I would say the, the critical issue is a matter of the resources and our sense that we can do something um, that would uh, make a significant strategic difference in this part of the world. And those are both at a relatively low ebb right now. So I'm, I'm less worried about us doing too much uh, in a sense and more worried that we may retrench far too much and just effectively give up the region. Um, or we may militarize everything and see everything through uh, the kind of through the, the lens of it's, it's all about a US-China competition and forget about what uh, regional interests might be and areas uh, where we might actually do more. Um, over the long term, I will say, uh, you had asked earlier, what does China get from this region? Um, if we play this out over, again, this is now a longer term story, uh, this is the means, that is continental Eurasia, is the means by which I think China can build itself into a more continental scaled superpower uh, with resources, with capacity to project uh, its military and with political influence throughout a much wider zone of the earth um, than it currently enjoys. And that changes, I think, the, the basic calculation of the US-China competition globally as we go forward in ways that are, are critically important. And so this part of the world, it isn't our priority. It, it is, as I said, we have other priorities, but it will be critically important. And I think we need to recognize that uh, for what it might offer uh, over time. So you point to, um, and you draw this out in the book at somewhat more length, the, the challenge of the risk of the U.S. over militarizing its response where Beijing is pursuing this strategy through a majority economic and, and cultural, if you will, approach or economic and political approach. And that brings us to the Belt and Road. And we've had a couple questions asking you to talk more specifically about the Belt and Road, how the Belt and Road is viewed from the perspective of the countries you write about in the book, and specifically, um, is, are its benefits to China mainly geopolitical, or does it in the end actual pro actually produce economic benefit for China? Well, great questions. I mean, the Belt and Road um, has clearly been the uh, kind of seminal uh, and leading uh, foreign policy, global policy of President Xi Jinping. Um, and it has, I think, both the commercial elements uh, and the geopolitical elements behind it. Um, but crucial parts of it simply don't make sense as purely commercial. Uh, and there are other parts that don't look all that strategic. And so you need both to understand it. Um, 
in Pakistan, the case that I, that I tend to know better uh, than the others, uh, we have seen sort of the, the great promise of the China-Pakistan Economic Order, which is kind of its piece of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, promise of uh, upwards of $60 billion of Chinese investment over a decade or so. Um, and then we've seen some of the, already we've seen over the past five years, some of the frustration and unmet promise. Uh, in part because some of the projects that were envisioned had no commercial viability whatsoever and have also been seen as not terribly important strategically for China to undertake without that commercial benefit. So the commercial element does play a role. If a project doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever commercially, it better have a good strategic rationale. Um, but we've also seen uh, broadly uh, somewhat retrenchment uh, in a sense, at, at least rhetorically, of China's goals for the Belt and Road Initiative across the board. That is, it's had to think for a second time about what it's really up to, in part in response to a global challenge uh, that had to do with questions about the debt that was being incurred by recipients of, of Belt and Road Initiative projects, uh, the environmental consequences, the labor consequences, the political and economic and other consequences. And there was some initial frustration. So China's had to rethink about uh, some of these efforts, scale some of them back. I imagine that the COVID will, will force an additional retooling uh, of the Belt and Road uh, project across the board or projects across the board, but it hasn't given them up. Uh, Belt and Road is still um, at the core of the brand President Xi, uh, and I don't think uh, can be done away with. It can't fail, uh, even in places where it hasn't been terribly successful, it can't be thrown overboard. And so it won't be, so it'll, it'll persist. Um, and it will continue to have this twofold element of commercial, uh, commercially viable exercises that will over time knit up the region, regional economic integration, and more strategic and even military oriented efforts uh, that are purely in Beijing's interest, um, but which the opportunities and openings have been created by local realities. Thank you for brilliantly answering the next question I was going to ask, which is, is there a strategic and military dimension to this? So thank you for anticipating the question. Um, and we're coming up on the last five minutes, so we will be able to squeeze in one or maybe two more questions, although given what the next question is, it may end up being the last one. Um, reminder to the audience that um, if, um, like me, this conversation has suggested to you that this book might reorient your view of this part of the world in interesting ways, you can go to the New America event page where you will find a link to purchase the book. Um, and of course, Dan, you knew you weren't going to get through an hour long conversation without being asked whether we are in a Cold War with China. And uh, so, so are we in a Cold War with China? How much of that Cold War framing, the questioner wants to know, is due to the current administration? And would you describe there being a consensus among foreign policy experts? Yes, we, uh, right. We're, I think the way I like to frame it, and I'm just stealing from others here, is we're in a new type of Cold War uh, with China, yes. Um, and, and no, I don't think that it's uh, been purely the consequence of decisions made in Washington, not, not remotely. Um, it is the consequence of the interchange between um, US perspectives and frustrations with China and a, a kind of a waking up to the reality of China's power and influence globally, combined with uh, an increasingly um, uh, internationally oriented and aggressive uh, Chinese leadership uh, under President Xi Jinping. And the combination of the two um, has been already uh, a big shift. And, uh, but it's consolidated a shift that was underway, I think, uh, for in some ways for decades. That is, China's power didn't rise out of nowhere. Its wealth didn't come from nowhere and it shouldn't have taken anybody by surprise. Nor should China's ability to translate as all countries I think throughout history have tended to do, to translate great wealth into political influence and also military power. Um, that's not surprising. Uh, but the shift that I think has caught all of our imaginations um, and certainly our attention in Washington, D.C., this shift has been exacerbated by the kinds of rhetoric, angry rhetoric, 
that are being thrown around by both sides right now. And that is unusual. And certainly I think that the Trump administration's um, approach here is not what we would have seen in some other uh, administration, just in terms of the, its, its use of words, its Twitter wars, and so on. But neither is the Chinese approach something that we've seen from China before. We now hear about so-called wolf warrior diplomats uh, who use all kinds of angry language to describe American officials and Americans more generally, uh, totally undiplomatic in ways that, um, you know, I guess we saw some of that back when in the Maoist era of, uh, you know, the Chinese, early Chinese revolutionary era, but China had become a more staid uh, diplomatic player uh, over decades. And now to see this come out and a plain to Chinese nationalism at home, and a kind of a, um, a stiff arm to public opinion uh, overseas uh, is new on the Chinese side. And so that kind of tension, I think, may be kind of momentary, and we may be seeing the apex of that. Hopefully, if we're luck lucky, we'll see that kind of resolve. But the broader strategic competition, I'm afraid, is here to stay, and we just need to figure out how we're going to grapple with it. Um, and that'll be up to, of course, uh, whoever's in office in, in January to, to figure that out. I just have to say to the questioner that I was recently on a Zoom call with about a dozen academics representing a variety of intellectual and ideological tendencies who pretty as, as much as you can get into a screaming fight on Zoom who got into a screaming fight about this question. So no, there is no consensus on this subject in Washington, D.C. Um, Dan, just to wrap us up really quickly, um, if you were writing this book in the time of COVID, what else would you what else would you have to say? Well, I think that most of what uh, I depict in the book uh, is likely to be accelerated by, by COVID. Um, that is the outsized potential for Chinese wealth and economic resources to sway its regional neighbors one way or another, particularly its neighbors, as I say, to its west, has probably been exacerbated by this moment. And not just by COVID, the, the public health uh, crisis, but really the economic crisis. Um, and beyond that, it's particularly devastating effects for countries that are dependent upon energy exports as their principal um, uh, economic support. And a lot of those uh, are to China's West. These countries are gonna be feeling deep, deep pain and China may be uh, the best placed country in the world uh, to make up uh, for their, uh, their losses in a way that would permit their leaders to salvage themselves might hurt their people, but to salvage their own positions um, and to continue keep the game going at home. And so that would extend China's influence. Um, otherwise, I think that COVID has also uh, hurt the United States so far uh, very deeply. And America's global leadership, uh, I think, if anything, has just taken a, a major uh, hit. And that is worrisome because as we think about our ability to to appear to be a useful, valuable, beneficial partner to any of these countries in China's Western horizon or elsewhere, um, they have to see us in those terms. And we have to present some positive uh, vision of leadership, of resources, of knowing what we're doing. And at the moment, I'm afraid even on all those scores, we're far more diminished uh, than even we were before uh, COVID-19. Someday New America will give me a happy book to do a book event about. <laughs> but um, Dan, thank you so much for taking your lunchtime to bring your book by New America, at least virtually. And thank you to all of our audience members who spent your lunch with us. Um, and again, you can go to the uh, event page for this conversation on our website, newamerica.org, and find a link to purchase Dan's book and find more events to come back for. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it.